morning. I'm going to tell you a story. It's a true story. It's 100% true. And at the end of it, you're going to ooh and ah, and you're going to think it's the most precious thing you've ever heard in your life. Because I'm going to tell you the story about how I fell in love with my wife. And it's going to get you in the feels right here. So uh, my wife and I met in seminary, and uh, we were friends. And I, um, I considered her as like a possible option. This shows you what a vapid, shallow human being I was. But I was not like crazy. I just, it wasn't there yet for me. And so um, I was in the Army Reserve at the time. She worked for uh, the marketing department at Chick-fil-A. And she was opening up a new store in Fort Worth. And I was coming back from Lawton, Oklahoma, Fort Sill. Anybody from Lawton? We do, we have one person, okay. I, didn't, I won't say what I said in the last place, in the chapel about Lawton. It's a great place, it's fantastic. Um, and so, uh, so I, I texted her, called her, and I was like, hey, I'm on my way back, I can swing by and we can have dinner together, because I thought, she's alone, she could use a friend. Little did I know my wife was very introverted, and loved being alone. Um, so we met at Risky's Barbecue in the stockyards at Fort Worth. Anybody eating at Risky's? All right. If you've eaten at Risky's, let's get a little bit of a higher hand raise than that. It's good, right? Let's get excited about something today. And so, um, so we met, and I was enjoying the meal. We were friends. We were having a good time. And then this torrential downpour came upon us, and there was thunder, and there was lightning. And I promise you, my wife's not here today in the service, but she was. you can ask her. You can track her down. She's in like read 203. She said, and I quote, lightning flashed, and I said to myself, he has never looked at me that way before. And it is a true story in a flash of lightning. I went from, this is my friend Kim, to this is the only woman I ever want to be with ever again. Right? Right? They're going to make a Hallmark movie out of it. It's going to be called Thunderstruck. And it's going to have ACDC playing over the top of it. It's going to be fantastic. Highly recommend. Um, I don't know who will play me. I'm assuming Bradley Cooper will be available for it. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Love is incredibly unpredictable and incredibly scary. And I think it's one of the reasons why we are so hesitant to invest ourselves in love. That's a big risk driving out into Fort Worth. It, was, it felt like it at the time, right? There are other risks, even after you fall in love, even after you get married, even after the story ends happily, it's still gonna end at some point. At some point, grief will take hold of my life. Either my wife will bury me or I will bury my wife, more than likely. Now that we've had children, I've been told, I was told a couple weeks ago, that you are only as happy as your least happy child. And that is so true. Fortunately, my kids are six and three and seem to be very happy right now, so we're in good shape. But there's a lot of grief. Some of you have buried parents this year. Some of you are about to. Some of you have lost brothers or sisters or friends. Some of you have lost spouses. Some of you are facing debilitating illnesses and might be losing a spouse. Love is unexpected. And it's scary because there's always the risk of pain. And when the love of God comes into our lives, we think it is just as risky, just as scary because we think there is no way he could love us the way he says he does. It can't be true. There's no way that it's true. And so what I want us to talk about today is I want us to talk about how we can embrace the unexpected nature of Christ's love. We're going to look at Galatians 5 verses 1 to 15. And I want to talk about the barrier to love, the source of love, and then the freedom that love gives us. And I hope that today, and this has been my prayer for you this week, is that you walk out of this room today, or you stop watching the online feed, and you say to yourself, or maybe this, maybe Jesus says, they've never looked at me that way before. I hope that this is your thunderstruck, lightning struck moment in your relationship with Christ. So first, let's talk about the unexpected barrier to love. Galatians 5.1, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, 
I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he's obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You would be justified. Who would be justified by the law? You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. What Paul says here in 5.1, 5.1 is a transitional verse. If you have to teach the book of Galatians and you have one verse and one week to do it in, teach 5.1. It sums up everything that came before it and it's a launching pad into what's next. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time there. But then he moves on. He goes back to his argument about circumcision and how this group of people have come up from Jerusalem, the Judaizers, and have told the Galatian Christians, hey, if you really want to follow Jesus, you don't need to just trust in Christ. You need to become Jewish, which is an act that culminates in circumcision for the men. And what Paul is arguing is that you don't get access to God that way. Look at 5.6. It says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. In God's economy, in the economy of having a relationship with Him, in gaining His favor, in gaining His trust, it's not circumcision. It's not any act of religious devotion. It's not any work at all. It has nothing to do with you and everything to do with Christ. The only thing that matters is faith working through love. And what he's saying here is that anything that's genuine love, any, any genuine faith in Christ, something that gives you, earns you, or gains you salvation, the faith that's the gift of God, it will manifest itself, it'll prove itself in love. It originates in love from God the Father, given to you through the Son and through the power of the Spirit. And we respond back to him in love for him and respond in love to other people, even love for ourselves. But to have that kind of love, to grasp that kind of love, to have that real love, you have to be connected to the source of love himself, which is God. First John tells us that God is love. And if you are connected to him, you are connected to love. But there is a problem. It's an unexpected one. And it, Paul tells us about it verses 2 through 4. It's what the Galatians are being told by the Judaizers. If you want to be close to God, you have to take on these acts of religious devotion. You've got to accept circumcision. And Paul's saying, hey, if you do that, if you make that choice to accept circumcision, you are saying that Christ is not enough. And if you say that Christ is not enough, you are cutting yourself off from a relationship with God. And I don't think he's intending a pun there. He's saying you can cut your flesh and cut yourself off from Christ, or you can trust in Christ and leave your flesh alone. He's saying that the way the law works is you either accept all of it, or you accept none of it. And we all know that keeping the law in its totality is impossible. But you might be sitting there saying, Travis, this seems like a really specific problem for a very specific group of people. 2,000 years ago. This doesn't really apply to me, but it does. Because you see what the Galatians were thinking about doing and what the Judaizers were trying to convince them to do was to justify themselves before God rather than trusting in Christ alone. Salvation throughout the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter, is always salvation by grace through faith. If you add works to the end of that, then it invalidates the whole thing. It jeopardizes the relationship with Christ. It jeopardizes your relationship with God. It jeopardizes your connection to love. You cannot earn God's favor. You cannot earn God's love. And this is a principle that's extremely applicable today, especially if you grew up in church. If you are a lifelong church member, guess what? This is very important for you because I seriously doubt that anybody in this room has thought about undergoing voluntary surgery in order to curry God's favor. However, every single person in this room, at one point or another, whether you are a believer or not, you are continually fighting a battle against justifying yourself. We justify ourselves before God, 
We justify ourselves before others. We justify ourselves before ourselves. There is something inherent in us. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a fear of being misunderstood. Maybe it's that we're trying to say we're actually not as good as we think we are, but we feel this compulsion, and that's what it is. It is a compulsion to justify ourselves, to explain our actions, to rationalize what we do. We justify so many things about ourselves. Let me ask you this. Have you ever felt compelled when no one is around, and I mean no one, and you're staring a dessert in the face, have you ever felt compelled to be like, well, I had a salad for lunch today, I can have that. Oh, I'm the only one. Okay. How about this? Or maybe I'm, I don't really eat salads either, never mind. Okay. How about this? Morning, take the kids to school, drop them off, and you swing by Starbucks, and you're like, I deserve the caramel frappuccino avocado or whatever it is. Add a bunch of O's to the end of it. Because the kids were really rough today, and I deserve this. And you're like explaining it to literally no one in the car. You may even be verbalizing it. I think I deserve this, right? Or how about this? How many of you feel compelled to justify an off day from work? Like, you're tired, you're worn out, you don't want to go to work today, but you're like, well, I really don't have a valid reason for taking today off, so I'm not going to take a vacation day. Despite the fact that there is an actual agreement between you and your employer that you can take a day off, and I'm pretty sure most of you don't have to give a reason at all. They're your days. Just take them. But we feel the need to justify ourselves, right? How about this? Let's say you're in traffic, you pull out in front of somebody, and they lay on the horn. And again, nobody in the car, it's okay. And you say this to the person in the other car who cannot hear you, sorry, I didn't see you. They can't hear you. But we feel this need, this compulsion, to justify why we pulled out in front of this person. And when it comes to our relationship with the Lord, we do the exact same things. God, I'm sorry I messed up again this week. It was a really rough week. I was really tired. I didn't stop for that Starbucks, and I got into some other things trying to escape. God, I'm really sorry. You know, I lost my temper with that person. It's just, they really irritate me. Or we justify, you know, when we kind of want something from God, right? Like, God, we took a mission trip to South Texas as a family instead of going to Colorado. You kind of owe us some family bonding here, Lord. Like, please let my teenager not be ruthless anymore. Or I read my Bible three times this week. God, you kind of owe me a good week. We justify that. Or we justify not doing something. God, that, I feel like you want me to give money to that person, but dang, I'm just convinced they're going to use that money for drugs. Or you know what? I know they need help in like preschool, but my gifting is not really with kids, so I'm not going to go there despite the fact that I haven't used my gift in like three years. I'm still not going to do that. Look, my point here is not to make you feel bad. It's really not. It's also not really to help you stop justifying yourself. My point is to make it very clear for one thing in your life. You cannot love other people and justify yourself at the same time. You cannot do it. It is impossible to love others and justify yourself. That is the barrier to love. Justification is the barrier to love. You spend so much time being self-conscious about your actions, focused on providing a defense for everything you do, you will be incapable of noticing the needs of other people, much less doing anything about them. And what's more is you'll be incapable of loving and worshiping God. Because how can you love and worship God freely, in spirit and in truth, if the whole time you were trying to explain to him why he shouldn't snuff you out? The whole time you should be like, God, I know, like I'm not. We spend so much time, so much time in our relationship with the Lord, thinking that he is disappointed, frustrated, irritated, and mildly tolerable of us. And you know why I know this? Here's why I know this, is I struggle with this too. And I am willing to wager that despite the fact that I'm the only one that does some of the other stuff, I am not the only one that struggles with that. I am not the only person who spends a lot of their prayer life trying to explain myself to God. 
Is that you? It's apparently a part of our sin nature to justify ourselves. Look at what Adam and Eve did. They eat the fruit, and despite the fact, despite the fact that they know who God is, despite the fact that they've walked with God, they had a perfect relationship with him. When he confronts them about it, what do they do? Do they fall on their knees and say, God, forgive us, and your grace, please forgive us, because we know you're gracious? No. They blame one another, and they justify themselves. God, the woman that you put here with me, she made me eat it. The serpent made me eat it, right? The biggest barrier to love is an apathy. It's not selfishness. It's not hatred. It is this compulsive disorder, and it is a compulsive one, that we've inherited from our first parents, Adam and Eve, to explain every single thing we do. To feel like that our life is a courtroom drama, and we are trying our own case before a jury of our own conscience, our peers, And the judge presiding over the whole thing is the one who created us. And that is why we don't love people. That's why we don't respond to God in love. It's because we are obsessed with justifying ourselves. So what do we do about it? What do we do about this? Let's talk about the unexpected source of love. Verse 7. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Paul goes on the direct offensive against the people who have come up from Jerusalem, and he calls them a lot of names. He calls them hindrances in verse 7, leaven ruining the whole loaf in verse 9, bearers of penalty in verse 10, and he caps it all off by saying that they should emasculate themselves. By the way, if you're ever in an argument with somebody, if you want to take things to the next level, might I recommend that suggestion? And kids, if you don't know what this means, ask your parents at lunch they will tell you, okay? But one of the things that's said in here that is not explained, and we kind of look over it because of the whole emasculation comment, is that he calls them unsettlers. He says, those who would unsettle you. This is a very specific Roman term, and what it means is a disturber of the peace. It's a legal thing. You would be put on trial for being a disturber of the peace, somebody who unsettles, which if you know anything about Paul, This is the pot calling the kettle black. There are nobody that likes disturbing the peace more than Paul. Like if he had a business card, it would be like Paul, apostle, missionary, disturber of the peace. This dude rolls into town and is like, all right, let's see if we can get killed today. That's what he does. So what's the difference? What's the difference with what he did to the Galatians than what they're doing to the Galatians? Because what he's accusing them of is they're coming into your happy church family and they're disrupting everything. They're destroying the harmony that you have. So what's the difference with what Paul did and what they did? It's three things. One, Paul told them the truth. Yeah, they were happy living their sweet little pagan lives, doing their thing, but he shows up with the truth of the gospel and he introduces them to Jesus Christ and they come to know him. So that's one, there's truth. Two, he loves them. He loves them. He cares for them. He told them the truth because he loves them. He wants them to know Christ because he loves them. The Judaizers do not love them because they're not telling them the truth. But the third thing is the work of God in their lives. Look at verse eight. This persuasion is not from him who calls you. Paul is taking persuasion and he's putting it up against calling and he's saying one is greater than the other. Persuasion is something that comes from other people. It's an external force on the mind and the will that somebody else tries to convince you of something else. Persuasion's not always bad. I might be able to persuade you to go get a hamburger with me at some point and that's not bad. But it's an external thing. And you can be just as easily dissuaded. Somebody else could come to you and be like, hey, hamburgers, bad for your cholesterol. You got like a little angel devil on your shoulder kind of thing going on. 
But calling is different. Calling comes from God. God does not persuade you. He calls you. He calls you. He calls to you. And you can no more reject that calling than you can stop breathing oxygen. That calling calls to you. And what Paul is telling them here is you are willing to give up this calling of God. You're willing to turn aside from it. You're willing to to let it go by the wayside. This great gift of the creator of the universe singling you out and saying, I want you. Why? Why do we do it? Why are we willing to give up to disregard the calling of God over the persuasion of men? There's a clue in verse 11. But if I, brothers, still preach uh, preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. Apparently at some point, and this was news to me when I was studying this week, Paul preached the same thing the Judaizers preached. Probably early on in his, his relationship with Christ, he preached, be a Jew first, then you can become a Christian. And then God was like, nope, that's not how that works. And Paul stopped. So what has happened is, probably, the Judaizers have come up to Galatia and been like, look, we're not telling you to do anything that Paul hasn't told other people before. And Paul's like, hold up. Yeah, I may have done that before, but I don't do that now. And if I did, I wouldn't be persecuted like I am. Because remember, being Jewish is a sanctioned religion in Rome. Christianity is not. And then he talks about the offense of the cross. Why is it that the cross is offensive? Why does he say that? This isn't the only place he does it. He says it in other places too. He says in another passage that the cross is foolishness to the Gentiles and a stumbling block to the Jews. Why? Why is the cross so offensive? Why do we hate it? You know why we struggle with the cross? It's because we find it impossible to believe that one person's suffering can pay for every single thing we've ever done wrong as a species. We find that really hard to believe. The Galatians were being persuaded that belief in Christ was a nice start, but if you really wanted to pay for your sins, you needed to cut off a part of your body. And here's the secret, and it's a secret that rests inside of us, and I think when I say it, you're gonna be like, yeah, I get that. Every single person here believes that pain is required for salvation. That pain is a requirement for salvation. Think about it. These are grown men willing to undergo a voluntary surgery so they can have some kind of assurance that God really does love them. But it's not just these guys. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Whether it's a sacrifice like an animal or something else, or in other religions, there's sometimes actually a removal of a limb to show how committed you are to the God you worship. When Adam sinned, what happened? God killed an animal and clothed them with the animal skins. In 1 Kings 18.28, the prophets of Baal cut themselves to get their God's attention. But look outside the Bible, look at human history. The monks in Middle Ages would whip themselves, it's called flagellation, to show their penance and devotion to God. In Hinduism, there's a group called the Sadhu, and they do the exact same thing. In Islam, there's the Day of Ashura, where people will flagellate themselves as well to show their devotion to God. Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, famously said, any religion that does not require the sacrifice of all things does not have the power to produce the faith necessary for life and salvation. But it's not just flagellation. Have you ever tried fasting? That's painful. Especially for those of us in our culture that are used to three, sometimes four, square meals a day. Fasting hurts. Fasting's uncomfortable. But it's not just religious pain. Many people physically cut themselves. Young people, young women especially, wind up cutting themselves. It's for different reasons. It can be to disassociate themselves from the emotional pain that they're in. It can be to have control over some kind of pain that they're going through. It can also just be to release endorphins so they feel better. But whatever the reason is, it is a kind of salvation. You are looking for relief from pain. That is a brand of salvation. Not eternal, but it's a type of it. 
This doesn't just apply to religious or psychological practices. Go get a gym membership and come back and see me when you've seen a t-shirt or you've heard somebody say this expression, no pain. Thank you, good job. We think no pain, no gain applies to everything. It's not just work. It's not just the gym. We don't always call it pain, we call it sacrifice, we call it hard work. But we truly believe that no pain, no gain. The great philosopher Beyonce <laughs> said that power means happiness, power means hard work, and sacrifice. But you see, this is where the beauty of the gospel comes in. Are you ready? This is where grace makes its grand appearance. Because every single instinct you have about pain being necessary for salvation is 100% correct. It is right. It's just not your pain. Because you can't, you can't have enough pain to pay the penalty. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, steps in and says, I'll take the pain. I'll take the suffering. My pain is their gain. My suffering is their reward. So you stop justifying yourself. You stop going through the flagellation of explaining your actions to everyone and anyone that will listen. And what you do is you accept what Christ has done for you. That is grace. That is the freedom that grace offers us. Jesus is enough. That's the beauty of grace. See, the thing is, Hindus, Muslims, Joseph Smith, Beyonce, they all have it right. Pain is gain. It's just not their pain. It's just not their suffering. It is the suffering of the Messiah. It doesn't come from personal sacrifice. It comes from Christ. It's Christ alone. It has been filled up with Christ. And this is the source of love. Christ died because he loves you. That's what grace is. Somebody explain grace to me this way. Grace is just the fact that God really stinking loves you. That's what it is loves you. Jesus loves the Father, and he loves you, and that's why he died for you. And there's no barrier anymore. Jesus was able to live life on earth without justifying himself. You know why? He has no sin. He doesn't have to explain his actions to anybody. You know why he taught in parables? He doesn't have to explain himself to anybody. You know why he's silent on trial? I think he answers Pilate once. Because he doesn't have to justify. He doesn't have any explanation. But he also doesn't say anything because it's a guaranteed way to get himself killed for you and for me. You see, when we put our faith in Jesus, and I don't mean just like a saving faith, like you walked an aisle one time. I mean every single moment of your life. Every time you have that impulse to explain away your actions, every time you're like, well, I hope I'm not misunderstood, you turn to Jesus Christ and you say, Jesus is enough. Every time you go before the Lord and you try to explain to him why you made the mistake that you always make, you don't do that anymore. I mean, yeah, you can talk to him about what's going on in your life, absolutely, but at the end of that conversation, it had better land you at Jesus Christ was crucified and it's on that grounds that I'm accepted by God. If your prayers don't land there, you're not done praying. Keep praying. So what does this free you to do? Well, it frees you to love. Let's look at verses 13 to 15 rather briefly. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. One of the Bible's revolutionary ideas is that freedom is not autonomy. Freedom is submission and dependence on God. That's real freedom. And so what Paul's telling you here is that freedom allows you then to sacrifice yourself for other people. Because now that you're not justifying yourself, now that you know you're fully loved and accepted by God, you can now serve God and serve other people without worrying about anything, without worrying what it means, without worrying the image it gives off, without worrying what, what it costs you. Because you have everything you need. This illusion that he makes here, this biting and devouring one another. He's talking about animals. Animals bite and devour one another. 
He's saying that when we justify ourselves, we're like animals because animals act on instinct. And our justification desire is an instinct. But when you love Christ, when you've got Christ's love in your life and you delve more deeply and deeply and deeply into the great love of Christ, you know what that frees you to do? It frees you to not act on instinct. And it frees you to love a whole bunch of people, chiefly, and one that I want to talk about real quickly, is the unlovable. There's lots of unlovable people. Maybe you have them, you see them as societal groups, political groups, things like that. Maybe you see it uh, in your own family. There's lots of unlovable people in our families. Most of the most unlovable people we know share our last name. Maybe it's somebody that comes around at Christmas, Thanksgiving, and you're like, man, if you would only stay away specifically during those times, it would be much better for everyone. But you don't say anything because you're a Southerner and we don't talk like that. Maybe the person who's unlovable in your life is your spouse. Maybe you had a really nice story like Kim and I had, but then you've been married longer than Kim and I have and time is worn and you guys are worn out with each other. Maybe it's somebody you used to share a last name with and now you're co-parenting with this person who used to be your spouse, you used to love one another and you find them exceptionally unlovable now. Maybe the unlovable people the people you work with, maybe it's somebody, yes, this happens in your church that you can't stand. Maybe it's somebody from your past, an abuser. Now that doesn't mean you let them right back into your life. That's not what I'm saying at all. I think the goal of forgiveness and love for somebody that abused us is that we should, our goal should be to pray for them. Get to that point. And pray with the, for them with this in mind. Their abuse of you came from a deep, deep, unsatisfied, need to be loved and a deep, deep need to justify themselves. They just went about it in a really horrible, horrible way. And that doesn't make it okay. It doesn't make it all right. Abuse is not okay. And if you want to talk to somebody about it, please come talk to me. But there's one other group, and I'll close with this, one group that we find exceptionally unlovable, maybe more unlovable than anybody else. It's people we don't know. Look, I got enough people in my life. I'm failing enough human beings as it is. I don't need to add to that. But there's a whole world out there of people that you don't know. There's a whole church here of people that you don't know. And I know we've held this book up for about three, four weeks now. And I know you're like, okay, Travis, we get it. You know, it's the growth thing. But here's what I want to present to you. This is not a book of classes for you to learn more things about God. They can be, sure. But if that doesn't excite you, maybe this will. There are going to be people who sign up for this, who sign up for these classes. These classes are going to be full of people that you don't know. And maybe your goal in signing up for something, and you should sign up, by the way, registration is a very loving thing to do to your church staff so that we know how many people are going to be there just so we can prepare. But maybe the most loving thing you can do is to sign up and walk in there and say, I don't know if God's going to give me anything out of this or not, but I know he's going to give me somebody to love. And my goal is to love somebody that I don't know. Sign up for something. Take on the opportunity to love somebody else that you don't know. Because Jesus came to earth, he dwelt amongst men, and he loved us before we ever knew him. I hope today is your moment of a lightning strike. And I hope you've seen yourself and the desire to justify yourself constantly to other people and that you've seen that, wow, I really do believe that pain is my way to happiness. But I hope you see that Jesus Christ has fulfilled the need for all of that. And I pray so earnestly that that burden gets off your shoulders. I hope it's totally off so that you are free not just to love other people, but to love the God who loves you so much and to love yourself as well. Let's pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, you are good to us, Lord, because you have set us free from so much, stuff that we're not even aware of. I pray that we would set ourselves, that you would set us free, rather, from this deep desire to justify ourselves and justify our needs before you, before others. Set us free, Lord God. It's in your name we pray. Amen.